Hi, can I ask a question? So first of all, thank you very much. I thought the film was absolutely brilliant, really enjoyed it, and also learned a great deal from watching it. So with this film, and also with another film we watched recently, The Emu Runner, in both cases, they depict some very poor practice by educators and social workers and other white professionals in Australia. And so I'm wondering, are these particularly bad and notorious examples of such practice, or are such practices very common and very widespread in Australia? Hi, everybody. Uh, Malcolm speaking. I can't talk for Australia. I can only talk for the United Kingdom in many ways. And so it's really important to kind of state that first of all. I'm a former teacher. I now work at universities um, in teacher education. I'm based at the University of Exeter. Um, I, I guess I'm supposed to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and what I would describe, I know you described poor practice there, Helen, um, and I'm gonna describe it within a UK context as relatively standard practice, some of the things that we saw in the film. Um, and I think we need to put that straight at the front in terms of uh, the misrepresentation of histories, as we saw when some of the teachers were reading um, stories from what we would describe as an aged um, book from the 1970s. We, we still read Mice and Men at GCSC in the United Kingdom today. And, you, and teachers up and down the country probably today have been reading every single word of that book, including those that many of us will find absolutely offensive. Um, despite the fact that we've gone through this process or seemingly gone through a process of being woke, quote unquote, or um, developing an awareness of some of the harms that the material that we pick um, causes. So just using that as a simple exa example, the process that we saw in education is practice, not necessarily poor practice. In terms of some of the responses from social services, from the head teachers that we saw, once again, we can just look at the statistics within a UK context and actually we can apply that to any diaspora community across, across the world um, in, in many ways. And we will see a very similar picture in the black and brown bodies, black and brown young people are absolutely gonna be spat out by the system. They're gonna be, there will be high levels of um, exclusion, whether that's in class, there will be high levels of off rolling. There will be high levels of uh, fixed term exclusions, permanent exclusions. There'll be high referrals to uh, mental health services. There'll be high referrals to uh, pupil referral units or detention centers. Do I really? And we will see that many of the educators in our education professions are do not share a cultural heritage or cultural understanding with the young people that they serve. Um, they are the facts. So I think we can relatively safely describe it as practice as opposed to poor practice. And that in itself is the problem. So my name is Man Jack, everyone. Um, I am Canadian. Uh, I, I sort of where I was born and raised. Um, but with that said, there's like sort of a contextual knowledge of um, where I grew up with the traditional territory of nations of like the Mississauga Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, um, and the Wendat people, and and now it's home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and we need to actively acknowledge that. And I think I was I grew up without that history, and I I'd mentioned it to some people earlier on, where the history of Canada, and more specifically the history of Toronto and Scarborough that I grew up with, was very different from the realities uh, that many people. Uh, experience and it is this conversation of like who tells the story it's the story of the victor and that's how we're going to describe the tales and that's how it's going to be and it's not correct um working in higher education some electorate bring on university um the one Malcolm said is very true I think there is it's one of the challenges that I that I see um isn't simply about this is the way it's done or this is just normative sort of practice but this like genuine fear of relinquishing one power as a whole but but for educators those in positions of power to genuinely recognize that they're in the wrong and I think that is that is what we need to chat before we start to have these conversations about what should we teach young people what should we tell them we need to recognize that there are people in positions of power who will flat out deny 
that they're wrong or that they're biased or that they're judgmental or anything like that. And I think that's a starting point for me first and foremost. And some of the practices that I do is about that full on recognition of, I want us to recognize what land we're on. I want us to recognize experiences of people. And that's, and if we start from that and relinquishing that expertise isn't held, the power and expertise cannot be held in the hands of the few. We're able to move towards something a bit more meaningful. I can't, um, you know, I can't agree more with what Malcolm said, and I'm not going to um, harp on what he said, because I think what he said was absolutely right. Um, but coming from a primary school, um, I, so I've been in teaching over 20 years, coming from a primary school. Um, and um, my, what I would say is that um, standard practice, which starts from the training of the teachers, so we have teachers that come into, leading on from what Malcolm said, we have teachers that come into the system um, who cannot identify with many cultures that they are going to be teaching. But the, I think the, the, the more, most dangerous thing is that they do come in with preconceived ideas. Um, that is based on their own history. That's based on, obviously, society in itself. Um, but they come into schools and they already have certain children that are deemed to fail. And I've seen personally that I'm not even sure if sometimes they're aware of what they're doing and um, how they're treating some of the black and brown children. Um, it, it's almost like, um, I don't even want to say it's unconscious bias because I think um, there is evidence that they know what's happening because they're grown up in a culture that treats people in a certain way and treats their history in a certain way. And I think until we have those, we have, we have the training in teacher colleges. So where, you know, where you're working, Malcolm, and other teacher training colleges. And if we don't start there and teachers going in with a greater understanding of the culture and the history of the children that they are going to be teaching, we will continue to have this practice. Um, therefore, and also on top of that, our children need to be aware of their own history as well. And if they're lacking in an understanding of their history and where they sit within the world, and I say the world because it's not just Britain. I mean, we're talking about Australia, this film, but it is the world. We talk about Canada, but it's where they sit within the world and the contributions that they have made to world history. They will accept what they're, they will accept the practice that's been delivered to them because they are none the wiser, as it were. So it, I think it's a worldwide education all across the board. Um, the decolonizing of the curriculum, it, it doesn't sit well with me in a lot of ways, um, but um, I get what they're saying. But at the end of the day, the curriculum just needs to tell the truth. And I think the best people to tell the truth are the people whose history it is. So this is one of the reasons why the decolonizer curriculum doesn't sit too well with me, because it's who's doing the decolonizing of it. And what is it that they are going to be saying, telling us or telling the world what they think we need to know again? I mean, everything that everybody has said so far, and I just wanted to comment on all of that in the South African context, most of it definitely the same. And for me, what's coming to mind is social capital. You know, we do have you know, with all these things, when we want to make changes, there's political will, there's all of those things that, you know, from the top down. Um, but I think so far in South Africa, and I guess in other places, it's, it's, it's social capital, who has the social capital, and who gets to, I guess, write the narrative and get away with it. And also, even for the children, um, like we're saying about children needing to know their own culture, and like where they you know, how they fit into the world. If your language, for example, isn't the language that's going to get you a job, isn't the language that's used in corporate, isn't the language that's used whatever, you yourself will not value it much, you know? Um, so even that, giving languages bigger roles to play. We have official, we have 11 official languages in South Africa. Um, but, you know, not all of them really mean much. They're nice to have but they don't really translate into anything that kids would want to hold on to and know that I can go far and I can, you know, get a job, I can do meaningful work in this language. So yeah, social capital, alongside political will and other things, um, 
would need to provide better incentives. I don't know how, I'm just saying. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. I mean, that's a very good point. Um, at the Steve Sinnott Foundation, the question we're always asking ourselves is, um, is the work that we're doing of value? And we're working with um, uh, different communities in Haiti, for example, and our struggle is um, that we want to support them to learn um, from a young age in Creole, because that's the language that's spoken at home. But we're really up against it because the private schools and um, the schools that parents want to send their children to teach in French. And so there is this lack of take up for um, the mother tongue language. So I think that's a really good point. But, you know, we, uh, as you say, we don't all know what to do about it, but we just keep taking small steps. Um, and we have, you know, supported Creole literacy um, programs because we think it's really important that young children um, learn in their own language. Um, but it's an uphill battle. Um, but thank you for your comment. I really appreciate that input. Yeah, well, I can share some um, feedback from people who have actually already screen screened the film, which kind of chimes in with some of the comments you've already made. Um, so I'm from Together Films from the distributor, the UK distributor. We're releasing this film in the UK. Um, just for a little bit of background, we released it last October with a really small cinema run. But obviously, we were pretty much kind of in and out of lockdown then. So it was quite a small release. You may not have heard about it then. Um, but our focus this year is very much about getting the film into schools, into education settings, so that people can use it as a tool for having these types of conversations. Um, so teachers can purchase a license of the film for £50, which gives them access to the film for a whole year, along with bespoke educational resources that we've created. So we have some example lesson plans, examples of um, different uh, classes within the curriculum where you might like to use the film. And um, we've also got a discussion guide. We have pre-recorded Q and A's from a number of different events, um, as well as some clips from when Dewan spoke himself at the UN. So we have all of those resources available when you purchase the film. Um, but over the last couple of months, we've had about 600 schools across the UK requesting screenings, which is amazing. And from our perspective, we've never quite had such an interest in, in an educational film. So yeah, it's really, it's really wonderful to know that there is an interest there. Um, but I have some audience feedback from both students and teachers to share. So there was one comment um, that you're saying earlier about, about people just not understanding their own history um, and not fully understanding the history of the true history of people around the world. So we have a quote here from a student when asked the question, did you learn something new from watching the film? And what was it? Um, I did not realize the extent of the hardship, hardships faced by our Aboriginal people. It was interesting to see the familiarity to Native Americans experience. And that's from a year 13 student. Um, it's not fair to treat Aboriginal people differently and the white, British, the white British rewrote their history. That's from a primary school student. Just a lovely statement here from a year eight student, treat all people with respect and fairly. Um, I mean, I could go on. I've got, I've got lots and lots of comments. Um, Justice for all cultures and races. That's from a year 12 student. Um, but I'll just share a couple of examples here from teachers, from different teachers who've used the film in different contexts. So we have Meredith, who's a primary school teacher, who said, as part of their screening, we paused the film a lot to have lots of chats about our feelings. The kids really identified with this film. We specifically spoke, spoke about loyalty to family and tradition versus modern society. Worlds apart and they still got it. Um, then I have two other examples I'll just share here from teachers. So we have Jackie, who's head of creative industries at Edinburgh College. So she's, um, I believe she's teaching kind of 16 to 19 year olds. It was a fantastic thought provoking piece of filmmaking. It shows you how much we have still not moved forward with these issues and the devastating consequences of not addressing them. And then we have Emma, who's a year 12 psychology teacher. I was pleased to show my year 12 students in my blood it runs and discuss this eye-opening and to discuss this eye-opening documentary. The class and myself were largely ignorant to the current climate in Australia and considered it important to engage in discussions about some of the issues raised. 
By the end, we agreed that the importance of voices being heard is fundamental to our society progressing in a compassionate way. And the message from the film is clear. We are all part of that and we all have a part to play. Um, so yeah, they're just a couple of examples I wanted to share, but if anyone has any questions related to some of those comments or questions about how you can access the film and share it um, in education settings, or like we said, share it with teachers who were training, because I think it could be, could be used as a great tool for, for teachers who are going through their training. Yeah, not, sorry, thank you, Becky, for sharing that. I think it was just it, what you had said and what the students had said had really prompted me to think about the last year in my classroom. Um, so there's a Somali phrase, I'll start with this. There's a Somali phrase that says, like without knowledge, there's no light. And I've always used that as sort of my phrase for like everything, like as difficult as information might be, as challenging, as upsetting or disturbing, it's important to seek knowledge in order for an individual to feel that they can make an informed decision, but just be aware of what's going on around them. Um, and one of, and so I've always, as, as an educator, I've always been keen on creating spaces where we have those difficult conversations, but we're not having difficult conversations for the sake of having difficult conversations. Like, I don't want to just bombard students with horrific information being like, all right, well, it is what it is. Like, let's move on now. But really, like, how do we unpick this? How do we relate that to ourselves? How do we position ourselves within these conversations? How do we acknowledge what our role is now, even though we weren't necessarily alive at that particular period of time? And one moment that like this will forever stay in my mind was a conversation about Haiti and um, the Dominican Republic and my students one saying never heard of this in my life like they've never recognized that there was a distinct colonization process and never recognized like a lot of the history and I think for me part of it was like not not being surprised that there wasn't a conversation about the history but just a fundamental conversation about colonialism or fundamental conversation about exploitation or, or why particular national relations are the way they are now, or why there are terms like third world, or why, like why we use the word underdeveloped, like any of these things that I would think might have come up at some point in their like final years of school before they picked this course, never. And I remember just sitting there being like, I don't know where to start now. I don't know where to start. Like, should we start? by unpicking our positions or should we start by talking about the actual things that have happened and feeling this like weight as an educator about like I don't want to torment students and they go home and feel sad but I also want them to really open their eyes and I think I just want to bring this back to the end that one of my first year students because they got their marks recently sent me an email saying that I wanted to drop out after the third week of you teaching me these things but I'm glad I stuck around because every week I felt that I was learning something new that made me a better person. And if that's it, and I don't, for me, it's like for them to, for individuals to feel that they have the power to now go forward and carry themselves or open their eyes or learn in a way that allows them to feel that they're a meaningful part in sort of like creating justice. I think that's it. My end goal is just justice. I don't really, Nice is a good word, all that stuff is nice, but like I was focused on just, like are we working towards a just society? Are we looking at addressing grievances? Are we looking at being, holding ourselves accountable when we need to? And yeah, I think I think it's just eye-opening where like I think as educators, it's also a mismatch of like what we think students should know or shouldn't know or why we talk about things. And sometimes we just follow curriculums because that's what someone told us to do. It's not helpful. That's my little tidbit. <laughs> Thank you, Mandek. Um, I don't think any of us are allowed to talk about changing the curriculum this uh, in this month of July, are we? <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, it definitely needs a, an overhaul. But um, again, who's going to do it? Who's going to make sure that it's fit for purpose? Um, Can I just add something about... Sorry, Malcolm. Malcolm I just wanted to add, just to follow on, you know, we were talking about the, the film 
And my experience of young people today, having a, a teenager myself, well, a young person myself who's currently at university, and a circle of friends around her that all seem to have the same mindset, is that they really want to make a change. They really want to try and do something. I think Black Lives Matter movement and the killing of George Floyd obviously raised the awareness to many people around the world that it wasn't just oh, here we go again. But they, you know, obviously having seen what they saw, um, people realise that, hey, minute, something's going, something's not quite right here. But the young people that I'm meeting really seem to want to make a difference, um, really want to do things. And they're not just saying they want to make a difference. They're actually going out and they're really being proactive. And I think um, a film like um, In My Blood It Runs starts that conversation and gives them an opportunity to delve deeper. And you can start with the film and work your way back. Because as you work your way back, you will things will start to highlight and they will think, oh my God, I didn't know that. It will just naturally flow and they will be enlightened to things that have just not been in the curriculum or that they weren't aware of. Because um, it's there. It's not to say that you're gonna make something up and slip it in. It's there, it's just been kind of airbrushed. Um, but yes, it's, the film is definitely a, a starting point and it's definitely a catalyst to start a, a, another conversation going and bringing that conversation to us today. Because I think it's great that we're understanding what's going on in Australia, but at the same time, we have to live our own truths here and we need to be aware of what's going on here and we need to know why it started like that and why we're in the position that we are in. And I think it's starting that conversation. It was probably just observations, and I'm going to try and bring it back to the film, but it's kind of triggered by something that Ivadni said, uh, and something that uh, Mendeka said as well. And it was, A, regardless of where we are in whatever context, internationally or in the UK or, or wherever, there's something about the practice of the practitioner that is really, really important in this. Um, and it's about, I'm almost going to describe it as facilitating spaces where some of the discourses can begin to be uncovered. Um, um, and that's partly, I, I don't like the phrase safe spaces because we're in hostile environments out here as the ones experience kind of clearly demonstrated. So I don't think we could ever call the schooling space safe if you are attempting to bring maybe an authentic indigenous or othered way of being into the classroom space. And that's really, really important. But as educators, we have got the opportunity slash possibility of enabling some of those things to, to, to come into the space, I'll, I'll, but we've got to be brave. An example of that is this. So when we, when we first watched the clip that Anne showed earlier on, I think the, all of the speakers gave their acknowledgements. Now, I was gonna give my acknowledgements, give thanks to the Most High, give thanks to the ancestors, but actually, honestly, I wasn't sure how safe this space was. So even though I'd seen the behavior modeled, I wasn't sure whether it was safe enough to meet for me to give my acknowledgements. So I gave my acknowledgements personally. We see that in the film where the one is watching the teacher tell lies about um, the history of Australia. We've, we've, we've seen that the one knows the truth, but actually, because I think he recognizes this space is not safe. I am unable to even give simple acknowledgements to those who came before me or to the most high. Um, if we are educators, do we create spaces in this hostile environment where that, is, that simple acknowledgement is even possible? It's a really, really difficult thing to do and I'm not suggesting that it's easy, but if we can't even give an opportunity for adults to give us a simple acknowledgement, I am not sure what our young people are supposed to do. So that's the, the first point I'd probably make. And the second thing that really comes to mind is the responsibility of educators, but also, and I'm not gonna call it the responsibility of our families in terms of eldership, in terms of our extended families, in terms of the young people, people ourselves, but certainly within a UK context, we, if we are parents, if we are carers, if we are part of extended family, networks and in particular uh, networks of black brown gypsy roma communities that are in the uk we also have to kind of think about how we manage that navigation that the ones extended family spoke about the way in which yes we need to kind of 
get that social capital that Molly spoke to, but at the same time, honor the ancestors, honor our, our ways of being. Um, and if you are in a space like the UK, that can be treacherous, quite simply. Um, that, is a, that is a task that's filled with violence, trauma, stress. Um, and as we've seen more recently with the, um, the football teams, you're, whether you're right or wrong, you're going to get it anyway. Um, um, so, so I think there were just two things that, that those acknowledgements and the safe, almost the safety of the spaces and, and how we can enable our families to truly honor their own, tr honor and name their existence. Um, I think that, that they're really, really important parts of our work. Hi, Anna. I did think the film was absolutely wonderful and it's not my area of, I mean, I'm a friend of Anne's, but it, it was wonderful, but also very depressing. And hearing you all talk, it sort of made me more depressed. And I want the politicians to see the films. I want the head teacher to see the film because in a way it's, you want the change to come from above because if it doesn't, you've got sort of one teacher trying to fight against this kind of monster. But I just wondered if there are any optimistic kind of bubblings or is it all as depressing as it seems at the moment? I will just share that we are in conversation with a number of MPs who are interested in joining forces for a screening. But I'm seeing Malcolm shaking his head that he doesn't think it needs to come from above. So I'd love to like hear your your thoughts and also if we get that screening off the ground we need people like you who are working in the spaces in these spaces to come and share yeah share your thoughts and opinions about what needs to change so um yeah i'd love to hear malcolm uh, you know what it was i was just going to literally say turkeys don't vote for christmas <laughs> uh, and it, so russell true. sprouts don't vote for christmas either um and so um as we, as has been, sorry, as has been proven with the movement for Black Lives over the last year in the United Kingdom, in particular, since the seventh of June, twenty twenty, as has been proven by the example. I can go backwards as well as forward in terms of these um, movements, as proven by the response in the United Kingdom to the defacing of the mural by the footballer Marcus Rashford, and the way in which one could argue the the local community reclaimed the mural. Um, people do the jobs. Politicians don't do the jobs. Politicians will respond to what the people demand. And so I think actually it's possibly much more empowering for our young people to see this film, as opposed to waiting for a head teacher who has got it in their gift to do this work anyway, to make a change. Similarly, MPs have it in their gift to do this work. They just choose not to. It is, and it is choice. So um, that would be, sorry, and to, uh, Anna, to be so critical. So my hope, I'm hopeful because I am sure just by the comments that um, Becky put in the chat, you show this film to young people, they are going to be energized, mobilized and lead the way in the way they did on the 7th of June, 2020. Uh, that was the day that Colston came down. Sorry, that's the reference, I'm sorry. Sorry, I just, can I just add to, um... So something that um, Malcolm said earlier about educators being um, taking responsibility, because um, at the end of the day, we have the, a captive audience. And I mean, I'm not sure what it's like in secondary school, but I know that as a primary school teacher, when those children sit down in front of you at nine o'clock until they leave at three o'clock, you have their full attention and anything that comes out of your mouth, they will they will take it and they will run with it. Um, and Anna, just to say with regards to head teachers, and Malcolm's absolutely right, that head teachers have the power to bring anything that they want into schools. But I also think as educators, we also have the power. And I think we have to take responsibility to start making that difference. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm radical, but I've been teaching Black History since I started in school, started teaching school. And just to go back to Molly's point about the languages, um, when I first started in a, in a school in Peckham, which has a, a high population of people from, um, from the African continent, and we used to take the register in different languages every week. So every week we had a different language. And I was just so surprised when I got to some of the African languages and the children would say to me that they don't speak it at home. 
that they're not taught the languages at home. And then when speaking to the parents, just as you said, Molly, um, well, what's the point of them speaking that language? Because, you know, it's no good anywhere else. Um, and coming from a Caribbean background where I'd wish my mum was in St. Lucia or somewhere where I could speak um, French or another language, I just think, how, you know, to, 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 to throw away a language, which is your culture, that's, you know, it's a bit like your name. When your name was taken away and you were given a, another name, you know, some people go back and they grab a, a name that represents their culture. And this is the type of things that we as educators need to start um, supporting our children and our parents and our parents need to feel good about their language our parents need to feel good about their culture um, it doesn't matter whether your language is going to land you a job but what your language will do will empower your children what your language will do is you will, will teach them their culture um, and give them a sense of purpose a sense of pride um, and the fact that you're speaking a language that nobody else speaks that goes back sent goes back centuries go back you know goes so far back um it's got to be something that we've got to start impo not imposing but we've got to start um educating and it is educating um our our parents and our children and um people for yeah molly so yeah i found it very emotional um i'm not uh, I am a, I'm an artist and an energy healer, and um, I teach intuitive art in a small, a small capacity, but um, I'm very passionate about it. I think what really got me with the film was the wonderful gifts that the child had that wasn't really seen. And for me, as a young child, and there's, I think everyone has a gift of being healers and being um, their own shaman. I think that's so important that that also needs to come out of each child. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I would love to get the film for my nieces and nephews, really, and my great nieces and nephews. I'd like to have sit down, get them all down and, and watch that film because it's not just about how you're treated because of the color of your skin, or, but it's also the gifts that we all have and I'm trying so hard to bring meditation into the family life with my nieces and nephews. And um, that's the side, I'm, so I kept quite quiet because um, I noticed everyone were, were teachers with children, but I'm just a, a healer, a energy healer. And I, but I'm very passionate about allowing young people to tap into the inside, the heart, the core of who they are. And that film was very powerful for me. And it brought back lots of memories as a child for me. So, um, so thank you. But I would love to get a copy of that. Uh, I was just looking online as well to try to get a copy of it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing. The work that you do with healing and art is really, really important. And, um, you know, uh, I think it's really important that you've brought up that point because I think it was a really positive point in the film that um, we've all got something within us to share with the world. Um, but we're so kind of pressed down by society that we don't often find it until much later in life. So thank you, Heather. Um, I think Molly had her hand up. Molly, did you want to? I want to say, Heather, you and I need to talk after this. <laughs> Energy healing. I've been reading up and watching videos, looking up sake and the emotional code and all sorts of things. This is exciting. Anyway, <laughs> but I think in the form where, you know, he... When the, when the teacher was reading from the book and talking about, you know, ah, so they say, we don't know, we don't think it's real or it doesn't sound practical or whatever. You saw how gutted he was because this is so, it's like, it's something that's so central to his being and his just belief system and, and just at the core of him. And to have it belittled like that and to have it, it, it was, I, I could tell he was gutted. And in the same way, even, you know, the words we use around these things. I know in South Africa, a lot of the spiritual stuff, African spirituality, um, 
the words that have been used over the years um, is the reason why people have lost faith in that sort of thing and also kind of see demonize it because it's called witchcraft and because it's called, you know, healers are called witch doctors and whatever. So it's all of those things that have also shifted, have made people shift from their core beliefs and made them not want to tap into those things because it's been demonized and it's just a lot it is a lot but anyway before that the comment I wanted to make was about our school leaders talking like principals and stuff I've always been optimistic Anna I think you asked if everything is as doom and gloom as it seems listen I'm like the biggest optimist okay but Last night, I was on LinkedIn. I know, Sunday, LinkedIn, I'm a loser. <laughs> but I saw this article written by a school principal. And this is a principal at like St. Albans. Now, these are like the, you know, top schools, private schools in South Africa. Very British, actually. Um, lots of, you know, history and tradition and just, you know, the turn out gentlemen they say but <laughs> this principle basically I just put it in the chat uh, please all of you read it and help me make a noise <laughs> positive noise but he says there's no place in schools for wokeness and cancel culture because he basically just feels like we are I guess people are just being disruptive for the sake of it it seems like the cool thing to be you know woke is like I think he calls it like pseudo liberalism as if you know, it's just this disruptive thing that people think is cool and that um, cancel culture takes away from having discussions. And I was trying to say to him, like, listen, it's not that people don't want to have discussions. People are open to having discussions. But if your opinion that you say, you know, people don't want to take other opinions uh, into account, if the base of your opinion is that other people don't have the right to exist or that they're less deserving and worthy of dignity and respect, then I'm sorry, your opinion deserves to be canceled. <laughs> You're allowed to differ an opinion, but let's not use your so-called differing opinion. Let's not agree to disagree while then enabling and allowing people with power like he does as a principal to continue to oppress and to continue to be gatekeepers of systems that make it difficult for everybody to participate, especially in education in this sense. But you should see the comments. Look at the titles of the people who commented, other principals of other high schools that are just top schools. And so I was depressed, but yes, I'm optimistic, Anna, but yes, <laughs> I've been a little sad because. I just want to make a quick comment on students when they're young developing that culture of just active like just listening and absorbing like sponges kind of thing like creating that culture that sticks that sticks for a long time and I think if there's a culture ingrained of I am the guru you are my disciple everything I say is a fact that will go on to when they come to higher education employment anywhere else and I think that's what we need we need to start tackling when kids are young in creating these spaces of like you are experts you are knowledgeable you're you have truths and knowledge that is valued thank you mandek um evadne final thoughts be the change you want to be in the world i think comes to mind at the moment um as i said before i think it's down to us as educators to start making a difference those of you who know me and who've read my bio know that I write plays based on black historical characters for children um, age seven to 18. Um, it's a start, it's, you know, it's small, but um, they get to understand a bit more about their cultures than their family come and they understand and their family and friends and their neighbors. Um, and we've got to start somewhere. But I do believe that the ball is in our court and we've just got to um we've got to try and do something really um malcolm um i'm still shook by oh i'm not i'm not surprised by the head teacher that molly kind of alluded to um i guess wherever we are whatever our position is whatever our, whatever our positionality is in terms of being an educator if we can create spaces where anybody in our educational spaces can engage in a process dialogue of love, care, understanding, where traditions are honoured, where people are honoured, histories are honoured, then we've got a shot at transforming the system. And so it's got to be based around, for me, it's got to be based around that and just bringing it back to the film. Um, the spaces where we saw the one engaged in 
acts of love was the spaces that he truly came alive. That was whether he was with himself in nature or he was speaking, speaking with his community or with somebody he respected. So if we can create those spaces, we get to transform wherever we are. So let's do that. Yeah, sounds like a good plan. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, I'd just like to thank all of you for joining today. I think it's been a really good discussion, very fruitful. And um, I can't thank you enough. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving up this afternoon when we're all overheated um, to have this really important discussion.